Welcome to the very first History of American Lit lecture. And we're going to start with early America. We're going to call that colonialism. We're going to start at about 1607 when the Jamestown settlers first landed and go to roughly 1750. These are rather arbitrary dates, but we have to work within some parameters. Um, it will be lecture one of two PowerPoints, so make sure that you watch both of them. All right, even though I said it started in 1607, we're actually going to start with the Pilgrims. They came a little bit later. I'm going to start with the Pilgrims because you're more familiar with them. You've probably heard more about the Pilgrims than anything else. Um, the Pilgrims were considered to be the purest of the Puritans in England. During that time in England, um, the early 1600s, late 1500s, there was a growing religious sect. Uh, they called themselves Puritans, or others called them Puritans, uh, because they set off to sort of separate themselves uh, from the Church of England. They really did not believe um, in a lot of the rules and the mysticism that they felt was associated with the Anglican Church in England. Now during that time in England, um, the Church was the Anglican Church, and it was really just an offshoot of the Catholic Church. Henry VIII had changed uh, to the Anglican Church and called it the Church of England because he wasn't happy with some of the marital rules in um, in England at the time, he wanted to get some divorces, and he also wanted more money, and the churches were very wealthy, and he wanted that money for the kingdom. So he changed the church to what's called the Anglican Church, and the Puritans were very unhappy with the Anglican Church. They were also very unhappy with the Catholic Church. Um, they landed on Plymouth Rock, 1620, Plymouth, Massachusetts, and they had a very difficult first winter, mainly because they weren't prepared. Um, they really hadn't done, I guess you could say, adequate research, nor had they brought adequate supplies, nor had they landed at the right time of the year in order to uh, make it through a winter and suffer through a winter. So they lost many people that first year. Now you notice at the top of the slide, I changed from Pilgrim to Puritan. And that's because we're going to talk now about the Puritans. The Pilgrims were very separated, and they really wanted to keep that distance between themselves and the Catholic Church. And some of the pilgrims were infiltrated with the Puritans, who weren't quite as extreme. Um, rather than separate from the Church of England, they just wanted to purify it. They wanted to fix it. They thought that there were a lot of things that were going right, and the belief system was basic, the basis of Christianity. They believed in that. They just didn't believe in a lot of the ritual that was associated with both the Anglican and the Catholic churches. And in fact, they felt so strongly about their ability to fix um, the church, and they felt so strongly about their interpretation of Christianity that they sought to create something in America that they like to call the city on a hill. And it's interesting because we still have this terminology today. Our politicians use this sermon of the city on a hill kind of um, dialogue when oftentimes when they're running for office. And basically it means uh, the, to the Puritans, they felt that they were going to hold us up as a religious example to the world. Nowadays, our politicians use it as we're going to hold democracy up as um, an example to the world. Now, a little bit about Puritan lifestyle, because in order to understand Puritan literature, we have to understand where they're coming from. Um, with the way that they live their lives. Now, during the um, early 1600s, we were calling that kind of a Baroque style in Europe and in England. And this is an example of the very ornate, over-the-top decorative dress. Um, that ornate style translated also into literature and into architecture and most everything uh, regarding lifestyle during that time period. And this is an example of a Puritan woman. And you notice that, you know, she still has uh, it's still kind of a big bulky dress, but she doesn't have nearly the ornate features, nearly the decorative features that the Baroque woman has. Um, pilgrims, uh, another piece of information about their lifestyle, as you can guess, definitely incorporated religion into their daily lives. Um, prayer meetings, daily, but daily family Bible readings. Um, in their conversation, may God be with you. God certainly has blessed us today. Um, all of those kinds of things were infiltrated into their dialogue, into their daily life. Now, the three doctrines of the, the Puritan belief system are kind of complicated, and we are boiling them down into a pretty simplistic explanation, but I think this is a good working definition for us. 
Uh, the first of the, the three doctrines is that the Bible is the only source of God's law. Now, many Christian belief systems still follow this today, so it's not too far off if you, if you have a belief system similar to that. Um, but what that really means is uh, the Puritan said, I don't have to rely on a priest. I don't have to rely on the clergyman necessarily to interpret the Bible for me. I can read it myself. I can figure it out myself, too. And, of course, what that leads to is multiple interpretations, and we still have that issue today. Um, original sin. And many of you are familiar with this. For those of you who are not, you'll notice this rather risque picture here of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And basically, the story in a nutshell is that God created a beautiful, perfect utopia, perfect garden, where he created man and woman to live. And he said, I have given you this wonderful land. I've given you this wonderful garden. You can live here forever in peace and harmony. There will be no evil. It will be wonderful. You only have one rule, and that is don't eat from that tree. Um, and Eve tempted Adam and said, hey, you know, God said we shouldn't do that. Maybe we should do that because it sounds like maybe God's keeping us from doing something pretty cool and pretty fun. They were tempted by the serpent, which is supposed to be the devil. Adam said, yeah, that's a good idea. They ate from the tree, and God said, that's it. You committed the first sin, and that first sin was really disobedience. And so God cast them out of the garden. Now, because Adam and Eve committed that first sin, that basically is called original sin. Because Adam and Eve were the first man and woman, they created a sin that we still have to pay for today. And so that is original sin. And the Puritans very much believe that uh, we still are basically recipients of that sin. The last uh, of the doctrines is perhaps a little bit more difficult to understand. It's something called predestination. And the graphic I have for that is really just a man sitting on a box thinking, what? I don't, I have questions. And that's pretty much where many of the Puritans were. Uh, predestination, basically that whole doctrine means that before you were born, God had already decided, because God knows everything, he knows whether you're going to heaven or hell. And there's really not a whole lot you can do about it. Um, that sounds really kind of a, like a defeatist sort of doctrine. However, there is something kind of interesting as Puritans added on to that. Uh, they said, yeah, you know, that's true. God has already decided whether or not you're damned to hell or you're graced with heaven. But there's a really good way to find out, and that is really through the way that you live your life. So if you make a lot of good decisions and a lot of good things happen to you, you're probably, it's probably an outward sign that you are one of the chosen, you are one of the blessed. Likewise, if things don't go so great for you, um, it's probably an indication that things aren't going so well for you, that you probably are not blessed and you are probably going to go to hell. So you can imagine that there's a lot of paranoia in the, in the Puritan lifestyle, a lot of inner turmoil, a lot of inner questioning, and a lot of outside judging. And it creates for very interesting and um, intense kind of society at times. More information about the Puritan lifestyle, even though they did sort of freak out uh, about where they were going, they did have very close-knit communities, and that was really out of necessity. Uh, they needed to work together in order to survive, and so they, they had to work hard. Um, they had very family-centered lives, uh, very God-centered activities. Most of their activities were revolving around some kind of church or faith-based activity. Um, as part of that sort of predestination doctrine, the Puritans really believed that if you were prosperous, and they believed in prosperity, um, they had backers from England who, who funded their trip, and they were expected to not just only go over there and found a church, they were expected to go over there, found a church, and make money. And they definitely believed that prosperity equaled God's favor. That meant things were going well. And as I said before, likewise, if you didn't have it, that meant that uh, maybe God's favor wasn't upon you, and maybe we should avoid you. You maybe had like a dark cloud hanging over you. Um, certainly there were some for forbidden activities for Puritans. This is the time when Shakespeare's plays were being presented in England, and uh, there was none of that going on in the Puritan lifestyle. None of that in the Puritan communities. No gambling, no theater, uh, no dancing no kinds of activities like that. They were considered to be sinful. In fact, in England, there was a great activity in the spring called Dancing Around the Maypole, 
And the children every year would dance around the maypole, and you've probably seen pictures of a tall pole with people holding ribbons, and the children would dance around it. That was a very forbidden uh, activity in England at the time for the English, English Puritans. And you can imagine with the pole and the springtime and the whole sense of fertility, why maybe they didn't agree with that particular activity. Uh, one really great thing that came out of uh, the Puritan, the founding of the Puritan area up in New England was this importance of literacy and education. In fact, the Puritans founded the very first college in America. You've probably heard of it. It's called Harvard. Um, and they believed in education for all, even education for women, which is very unlike European standards at the time, even for women who were upper class. Many of them did not, their, the powers that be decided that those women really didn't know how to, need to know how to read. They, they had other skills they needed to work on, like art and playing the piano and so on, but they really didn't need to know how to read. Um, and Puritans are very different from that. Now, I want you to think for just a minute about why. Why would the Puritans believe in education for all and really found uh, the beginnings of public education in this country? Well, the reason is, if the Bible is the only source of God's law, then everybody needs to know how to read it, including women, including children, rich, poor. And there was a social hierarchy in Puritan New England. Believe me, there were poor and, and, and wealthy people. Um, but all, education for all across the board, which definitely was very much against the European standard at the time. All right, we're going to talk a little bit about um, how the Puritan government was run. The term that we use is a theocracy. In reality, the Puritans didn't have a pure theocracy. They had what was called a theocratic government. And in a theocracy, God is considered to be the head, the sole leader of the land, and his laws, the divine laws, are also the laws of the land. So if you look at the Ten Commandments, many of those make sense, like thou shalt not kill. Well, we have a law that says, you know, murder is a, a crime. So that makes sense. But there are some other laws um, in the Ten Commandments or other Ten Commandments that don't really translate into our laws. For instance, one of them is uh, you shouldn't bear false witness against your neighbor. You shouldn't lie. Well, that's really not a sin um, in and of itself. If I gossip about you or tell a lie about you, I really can't um, be arrested unless it causes you you know, severe harm. Um, and when we look at those kinds of things, we find out that the theocratic type government can be pretty dangerous. You can think about some different countries uh, in the world today um, that have that kind of Sharia law or uh, theocratic law. Now this cartoon is, is kind of a flip of that. Hell always says, I'm from the government and I'm here to decide who the Lord your God is. I guess you could flip that and say, hello, uh, I'm the, your God and I'm going to tell you how your government is run. All right, um, a little bit more about theocracy. As I said before, it's a form of government in which the clergy uh, bestows all legitimate political power. So there's the, the clergy uh, plus the laws equals this poor fella being humiliated for gossiping. And that is what happened oftentimes in Puritan society. If you committed adultery, if you committed one of those Ten Commandments, one of those sins, if you, if you practice some kind of uh, witchcraft or something, um, that was punishable, and it could be punishable by death in the Puritan society. All right, um, this should go to your charts. So take your charts out and fill these in. We're going to kind of, again, wrap up in a nutshell what Puritan philosophies look like. Um, what did they rely on? Obviously, they relied on revelations from God and their belief in God, their faith in God. They behaved with what we call abstinence, and abstinence means to abstain or to not do. And so basically, they didn't do a lot of things they thought were sinful, as we talked about before, dancing, gambling, um, going to plays, those kinds of things. They found evidence of their beliefs in, in the religion, in uh, God's law. And of course, their center force was God. They talked a lot, as you can imagine, about predestination, wouldn't you? I mean, if, if you were taught that the life on this earth is short, and indeed it was, for many of them, there was a you know, high mortality rate, you were more concerned about what was going to happen to you after you die. And so that became a pretty hot topic of conversation. Um, with that as a topic of conversation, you might be a little pessimistic about the future. You also might be pessimistic about the future because you had a high mortality rate. Um, life was hard, and a lot of people didn't make it. Lastly, uh, and this is probably one of the most important and interesting 
elements of Puritan philosophies, they believed that they were the chosen people. They believed that they, for the most part, were the predestined for heaven group. They were the good guys. And were there people in Puritan society that maybe weren't? Of course. Was there crime in Puritan society? Certainly. Um, but by and large, they believed they were the chosen people. All right. Uh, part two is coming up. Please do not forget to tune in to part two of the PowerPoint.